Hello, everybody. Welcome back. People of Earth Season 1, Episode 8, our grand finale for the first season. And couldn't be more than pleased to introduce you to our special guest, Mr. B, the Gentleman Rhymer, a proper chap from across the sea, hailing out of London, England. He's created not only Chap Hop, but Chap Step. And today we'll be talking about his musical background, what led to the creation of these new styles, how there was instantly a rivalry right out of the gate, as well as, of course, his favorite superhero. And stick around to the end, and you might even hear a little bit of a special performance for us. So thanks a lot for being here this season, whether it's one stop or you've been here the whole time. Greatly appreciate it. And once again, super happy to introduce you to Mr. B, the Gentleman Rhymer. Welcome to People of Earth. <laughs> Mr. B, the Gentleman Rhymer, also known as Mr. B, the Gentleman Selector. Welcome to People of Earth. I greatly appreciate having you here. It's a pleasure to be here, sir. <laughs> well, um, not knowing exactly how much uh, you are known in the United States, I figured I would uh, give you the opportunity to just kind of intro yourself and, and give us a little bit of history on, you know, what led to the creation of Chap Hop and even chap step if you will um i think is the proper Indeed. term um so just getting to know you a little bit what is your musical background what led you to this place and and why the banjalele ah there you go well the banjalele i mean if we start at the banjalele um well effectively it's a ukulele really i mean it's, it's a, a ukulele with a banjo drum so it sounds like a banjo but it's actually a ukulele and the ukulele was, i think it was somewhere around the turn of the century as we'd now call it um, I was looking for a present for my godson and he uh, and I just it was a time when he didn't see many ukuleles around. It was just before the, you know, the ukulele resurgence, the Renaissance, <laughs> as it were. And um, I thought uh, I just saw one in a music shop and it was about 15 pounds. And I thought, well, let's have a look at that. And he could he could smash that up. He was only like three or something. And then I went into the shop and the chap tuned it up and played a couple of chords. And I immediately thought, well, I'm having that. So I, um, yes, I got one for my, uh, my godson and then another one for myself and started nice. learning the ukulele. So, uh, and then that progressed into, there's um, a chap who probably wasn't that well known in the States called George Formby, who was an old music hall star. And he was actually an enormous film star here in the kind of, third, well, 40s, I guess um 40s and early 50s and he was a cheeky chap from the north of england who played uh songs on yeah on the banjolele basically had songs like when i'm cleaning windows lots of songs which now obviously clearly <laughs> you couldn't get away with because basically he was effectively saying this is what i see when i'm cleaning windows you know naked women and gotcha. what have you so it was all slightly wrong but it was the 1940s and um yes yeah, so he was a uh, yeah, he was a bit of a star. So I thought, oh, you know, I always liked the sound of that instrument. So I bought myself a banjolele and uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> but as far as, yeah, but as far as history goes, I was, gosh, I was, I've, I've somehow got away with being a musician for over 30 years now, really, effectively. Okay. I was in a small band in my, locally, that ended up getting on a little TV show over here called The Word. That was the name of the TV show. And um, then I joined another band that already had a, a deal, uh, which was a sort of, yeah, sort of hip hop crossover band called Collapse Lung, which was a very un hip hop name. But they, you know, they started the band as a joke and then immediately got signed. So they, yeah, suddenly, you know, they, they, they lost, they, they didn't quite get the point when they could change the name. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I joined them for a while and we, yeah, we had a sort of minor hits with a song which was used on a soft drinks commercial. And uh, yes, so um, and that would yes meant that we could actually keep working. <laughs> that was the main what thing all, about it. What all roles did you have in those bands? Was it instrumentals, vocals? Well, the first band I was sort of I would program drums and play keyboards and sometimes play guitar and do a bit of singing, so a bit of everything. Okay. And then with with Collapse Lung, I was I was the rapper. I was the front man, as it were. 
So that's where the sort of hip hop end of things came from. And then after that, gosh, after that, I did stuff just on my own under the name of Sergeant Rock, which was more sort of slightly fat boy slim esque, okay. sort of quirky breakbeat dance music. And that I yeah I made that started because I made a a tune, and about, it took me about an hour and a half to make this tune because I wanted something to listen to on my bike on the way to the pub. And I was a bit bored with whatever I had, so I just made up this little tune, and so I had something to play on my bike. And then it ended up in a in a bidding war with two record labels that wanted to sign me because because of this tune I'd made in like an hour and a half for my bike ride. And so that was um, yeah, I did that for a while, and that that was there's a lot of it didn't sell any records, but it uh, um, it was sort of plundered for for TV and films and things like that because it was a, a sort of in a slightly zeitgeisty sound of, of of the time okay and then yeah then after that god this is a lot this is a lot after that i moved down to brighton on the south coast and uh i formed a little band with a couple of friends there and it was effectively a sort of a banjolele based covers band so some of the sort of interpretations <laughs> i do of things as mr b came from this band called rock onic and bob so it's just bass uh bass guitar uh drums and me playing banjolele and singing but we do old sort of, you know, rave covers and things like that. Things you wouldn't expect someone with a banjo lady to be doing, which is which then and that that broke up. So I just took elements of that. And I was also had while I was um, in Collapse Lung, I had another band called the Schooner Boys, who were what I called a dandy punk band. So they play we play sort of punk songs, but singing songs about sh quaffing sherry and you know, we had a song called Decanter Riot, which I thought was rather good. I didn't actually write these ones. He's written a guy, a chap called Paul Turner, who's, who's a brilliant lyricist. And uh, yeah, so, uh, and eventually, yeah, eventually Mr. B and Chapop was invented in a pub in, in Brighton. I just kind of almost came up with the whole thing. <laughs> I just said, right, I'm going to do a thing. It's going to be called Mr. B, the Gentleman Rhymer. It's going to be called Chap Hop. The original plan was I was going to do everything from a Chesterfield armchair. Okay, <laughs> but uh, then I realised, for one, it's very difficult to play the banjolele in an armchair, yeah. and two, uh, I, I couldn't be carting a Chesterfield armchair around everywhere I went. So I thought the travel it would light just stand the performance, up. Performance, I'd say, yeah. <laughs> yes, possibly. Yes, yes. Maybe, <laughs> maybe in my in my sort of you know in my dotage, perhaps I will uh, tape to the armchair and just do shows just from a from an armchair. But that time has not yet come. Okay. So set the record straight. Is there any relationship between steampunk and chap hop and the, the origins of it? Um, or is it a completely separate item? Well, I mean, this is it. Chap hop and what I do generally seems to touch on a few, you know, it, it's, if you do the Venn diagram, there's just, a, you know, if you've got <laughs> chap hop in the middle, there's little elements of these other things like chapism and electro swing and steampunk and numerous other things. And obviously hip hop and folk music, I suppose, with the banjolele. So it def definitely, you know, I play a lot of steampunk do's. And okay. actually, last when I was in in the states in uh, Richmond, California, I played at a thing called Steamstock. I think it only went for one year because it was they <laughs> they booked an enormous this enormous place where they used to build tanks. I think during World War Two, and it was just it was just very ambitious. I think the whole thing and possibly a little over ambitious. Possibly yeah. yes, it was great though. It was brilliant. But I think they decided not to do it the following year. <laughs> nice. Not my fault, obviously. <laughs> so created in a pub, when when did it kind of break out and become your first record? Well, well, this is it. <laughs> Actually, I was in I was in another band okay. uh, with a, a Northern Irish chap who we had a band called Butternut, again, which was a sort of hip hop thing. And we ended up having a record out in Japan and we went and did a little tour in Japan. And I'd just come up with the idea of Mr. B and Chap Hop, and I'd recorded one song called A Piece of My Mind, which was the first video I put out. And I'd put it on a MySpace page, but I think I hadn't even done a Mr. B MySpace <laughs> page yet. It was back in those days. It was that long ago. Um, so I put it on my Sergeant Rock MySpace page, this little tune. And it turns out these these Japanese people that put on these shows were total music nerds. And we went for dinner the first night we were playing in this little club. We went for dinner beforehand. And it turns out I'd mentioned that I did a thing called Sergeant Rock and they're all going, Oh, Sergeant Rock. We know Sergeant Rock. 
And somehow they knew this stuff. It sold, you know, it sold nothing at all. But somehow they knew about it and they had a record label and they said, um, you know, we'd like to put a Sergeant Rock tune on a compilation. I said, great, that'd be brilliant. I said, oh, have a look at the MySpace page and see which one you want to put on there. And they said, oh, we'd like to put this one called A Piece of My Mind on. So I'd say, all right, well, that's actually not a Sergeant Rock track. That's a thing called Mr. B, the Gentleman Rhymer that I've just started doing. And they said, well, we want that one. So the first actual Mr. B release was on a Japanese compilation that's from awesome. a label called called Second Royal in, uh, in um, where was it? In Osaka, I think. So that was the first ever <laughs> actual chat pop record. Um, Sadly, you know, I, I thought I maybe might be able to get Chap Hop over to Japan. But after we finished this tour with this band, Button Up, we spoke to the guy that put the record out and we said, you know, obviously we've done the tour and how's the record going? And he just said, surprisingly badly. <laughs> so and I think he said, I've decided we're not going to do hip hop things anymore. So then the Mr. B thing was slightly shelved as far as Japan went, which is a rather a shame because I think I've been to Japan since and done a few little Mr. B shows and it's always been it's always been great. There are many elements. I think which people in Japan enjoy, but it's I've still not managed to crack that market as it were yet. Yeah, it surprised me. I was talking to the band Psycho Stick, and uh, I think they said that their most views on YouTube and and some of their revenues were coming from Japan. Oh, and really? They weren't expecting it till they kind of got into the data and was looking at everything. Wow! Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. So, are they gone over there, and are they going to make the most of it? Um, I don't, I don't recall if they've been there yet or not. So, I'll have to, I'll okay. have to check in on that. Yeah, I guess <laughs> that's the thing. It's, I suppose if you're a band, you know, a, a band that are, are, you know, that are not hugely famous and have lots of backing, it's difficult to get an entire band over to For over sure. to Japan. It costs yeah. a few quid, as it were. <laughs> Nice. Um, before I get into my second topic, I, I want to hit you with the one thing that uh, everyone in the U.S. wants to know, which is uh, tell me who your favorite comic book character is and why. Oh, um, well, when I f first started collecting comics in probably the late 70s, it was always the thing from the Fantastic Four. OK, I think I like this sort of human monsters, as it were. Like I had, used to get the Fantastic Four and the Hulk. And I just always loved the idea of the, the sort of, yeah, the, the human monster. And the thing was just, well, he was funnier than the Hulk. He was just yeah. a bit more, you know, he was a smart ass and that sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, so I was just slightly obsessed with him. And I remember when the, that first Fantastic Four film came out in like 2004 or whenever it was, or maybe it was earlier, something yeah. like that, whenever it was, I remember thinking, because it was the early days of CGI. I remember thinking, oh my God, they're going to do like a CGI thing. It will look incredible. Mm -hmm. And no, it was Michael Chiklis in a suit. So, yeah, I was excited which was a little it was bit... going to be Michael Chiklis, but then the result was not what we hoped for. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> he just, it was just very slight in a way. I mean, I know Michael Chiklis is not a slight man, but if, yeah. but he's a slight monster. Right. <laughs> so, yes. But uh, yeah, so I'd say that. But in a you know, more recent time, I'd probably say it would say Harvey Pekar, I guess, as a comic book character who Who's does uh, Harvey Pekar. He's um, well, they've made a film about him with Paul Giamatti in it called American Splendor. He used to do American Splendor oh, okay. comics. OK, yeah, I, I've kind of seen slice that, of, but I've slice never read the life. comics and it's been right, ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and they're very, you know, this thing, they're very, they're very non superhero is about him going shopping and what yeah. have you. But I kind of just really I and I sort of used to do some of my own little slice of life comics myself. I'd often just record conversations I had with friends and then just transcribe them and turn in, turn them into slightly strange little comics. Feeding off the chap hop, uh, evolution, if it were, it's, it's funny to me that there was a genre that was so new, but blessed with a rivalry, like right out of the gate. So <laughs> yeah, tell yeah. me a little bit about your, your beef with professor elemental. Was it, was it natural? Was it conceived? Like, how did that come about? It, it was, well, the thing is it, the whole thing was we live in the same town as well, which is the kind of amazing thing about it. And we'd both been doing what we do for about a year or so before we even knew the other one existed. <laughs> We had no idea. Somebody, it was somebody who was in a in a ukulele based band called the Bobby McGee's, and he How said, many "Oh, you ukulele seen... bands are there?" <laughs> oh, it's all oh, they got. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Okay, <laughs> there's right. lots. I'm learning <laughs> things today. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of sort of smaller towns around the UK, you'll get you know little ukulele groups 
okay. which is usually usually often these days older people who get together and just play along some songs on the ukulele and what have you. And, uh, and many of these end up going off to form bands. Okay, I I live in Columbus, Ohio, and I live a sheltered life apparently. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it, it was, uh, yes, this guy said, oh, have you seen Professor Elemental? You should check it out. So I had a look at his video and thought, oh no. And then I looked how many views it had had, which was quite a lot. I was like, oh, damn. Um, so, and we, I think we first met weirdly at a, at a public enemy gig in Brixton in South London. Oh, beautiful. And um, we got chatting there. And then we didn't see each other for a, quite a while after that. And then he, he sent me a message and just said, I'm just letting you know in a gentlemanly fashion that I'm doing a diss track against you and it's coming out tomorrow. <laughs> so I thought, okay, let's have a look at this. And it was quite funny. We, my wife were talking about it yesterday saying that uh, <laughs> there's loads of my sort of people I knew were in his diss, diss video. I thought, what, you cheeky swine. <laughs> but uh, yes. So, and then we met up after that and he, we, you know, I'd sort of, we sat down for a bit. I said, well, you know, I'm not biting your style, don't you? He said, no, of course I know that. I just always wanted to do a diss track and you're the only person logically that's come along <laughs> that I can do it for. So we did that. And it's sort of, you know, we've had little, a few little battles and things like that along the way, but um, actually I went for lunch with him yesterday. So, you oh, know, we're, we've become friends, but we're, it's one of those things we're, we're sort of, you know, we're frenemies, I suppose. Okay. We've always got an eye on each other. And if, if, you know, if the other one, one of us sees the other one doing something quite spectacular, you just say, damn it. And it, and it does push us both forward to, to doing more, I think. And to, I think if it wasn't for Professor Elemental, I wouldn't probably have worked as hard as I do on the whole thing. <laughs> I would have been a lot more blasé about it thinking, oh, this is just my thing and it's fine. But um, awesome. also, it made, also it made for a great story. Obviously, yeah. you know, this is it, you know, so we ended up getting a bit of press for it and what have you. So it was, well, I, I, the reason I asked the question was I figured it was a brilliant marketing gig, kind of like Pepsi and Coke, where, you know, you create the rivalry and, and it forces everyone to pick a side and everyone's talking about it because you have to pick a side. So that that was my yeah, guess coming into this, but it, it's, it's actually it, fun to hear that it was a little was, more natural than that. It was, yeah, definitely much more organic than that. It just sort of happened. But, you know, and then to, to our surprise, it turned into this story that, yeah, there was this new genre and there was already a beef going on <laughs> within it with the, with the only two people doing it. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a kind of happy accident, really. An angry accident, you might say, perhaps. I think nice. the thing was that he he was doing lots of shows and it would occasionally happen to me. He said lots of people come up to him and say, oh, I saw your video straight out of Surrey or I saw your video, a piece of my mind. You go, no, that's not me. Or people would think he was me, <laughs> and occasionally people would think I was him, and say, "Oh, I like your song about tea." I'm like, "No, that's not my one. That's someone else." So I think it just, yes, it kind of got it got on his nerves a bit. So he thought he needed to do something about it. Nice. Well, uh, you mentioned straight out of Surrey. That that is actually um, the first thing I encountered with you. So. Um, it goes back 12 years. I'm at a dog fashion disco concert. I'm standing in line. Wait, I'm, one second. You're also yeah. what? What's that? Are you at a, oh, a dog fashion disco dog concert? Dog fashion disco is the name of the band. Yes. Okay, um, great. I, th I was just picturing, <laughs> I, I was thinking, what is this event? A dog fashion disco <laughs> yeah. concert yeah, the band on the not the event. That's incredible. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And it was actually a reunion <laughs> show for them. Um, right. And I was standing outside in line and I just chatting with people about different things and, you know, where they're from. And it ends up that this guy next to me was from London and we were talking about different bands that we might like and stuff like that. And, and he mentioned your name and I was like, okay, well, I definitely have to look this up. And the, <laughs> I, I've long been an easy E fan. And so as soon as I, I see straight out of Surrey and start playing that, like instantly <laughs> spent all like, okay, I got to find out everything about this guy. Um, so that, that begun me on the, the track to uh, learning more about your music. Yeah. Superb. That's, <laughs> yes. That's always, always good to hear these, uh, yeah. These origin stories of how people found out about it all. Yeah. And that was in Baltimore. So, I mean, the odds of me right, from right. Ohio ending up in Baltimore <laughs> with somebody next to, uh, you know, from London and having this conversation was just great. Um, <laughs> Finding out about Chapel in Baltimore. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that said, um, 
there's not just Min Mr. B, the gentleman rhymer. There's also Mr. B, the gentleman selector. And so what led to, uh, what led to that? And, and where, where's that kind of going for you? Well, that's in a way, Mr. B, the gentleman selector is just, it was my, it was me more doing, well, what I call chapstep or mm -hmm. my, or when I DJ, I'm Mr. B, the gentleman selector. So it's one of those things that if I'm not, if I'm not physically rhyming a lot on things, then I'll be Mr. B, the gentleman's lecture, or sometimes Mr. B, the gentleman animator, or Mr. B, the gentleman something <laughs> or other. I think it's all, you know, it's all under the Mr. B, the gentleman umbrella, if you like. But yes, I did um, <laughs> an album of sort of slightly chappist sort of acid house called uh, Acid Ragtime, and, um, or Chapstep Volume 1. And then I did another one called Old Jack Swing, Chapstep Volume 2. Mm -hmm. And these are two, these are two albums which I, foolishly i think went under the is to be the gentleman selector moniker because if i look at spotify they've had hardly any listens at all whereas everyone looks for mr be the gentleman rhymer well that's what and, i was curious uh, about because it uh yeah it it starts to dilute your brand right like so exactly yes i think this me. is it yeah i think the next one the next chap step album i do you know chap step volume three will um be under the mr be the gentleman rhymer name rather than mr be the gentleman selector name I would maybe have to try and work out if I can actually change the names on it on Spotify <laughs> or what have you on the streaming services, because it's just, yes, it was just a little bit of a misfire in a way, as far as just the name goes, I was really happy with the recordings and lots yeah, the of people. Products are, great. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was just, yeah, slightly hidden away. So, uh, I think yes. one of my favorite parts in, in one of the videos is you actually, and I'll probably overimpose it here, um, is it says, don't worry, this is a side project. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, of course. Well, I kind of, I do like that kind of slightly breaking the fourth wall thing every now and again, just sort of, I've got a song called I'm looking forward to leaving from uh, my 2019 album, Dandin Easter. And I always say, well, I, I sort of, it's, it's, I sort of always nicked it off a Larry David thing from when he was presenting Saturday Night Live. And he said, you know, what my favorite thing to do is, is to leave wherever I am. <laughs> and they kind of struck a chord. And I think it's almost become like, the introvert extroverts anthem. But I also, if I'm playing at a festival, I'll say, you know, you know, all the, uh, all the acts that you're seeing tonight, they look like they're living their best lives, but really in their heads, they're just thinking, I'm looking forward to this finishing and going home. <laughs> or maybe it's just me. <laughs> um, so I do like that kind of breaking the fourth wall thing every now and again, and just saying, you know, showing a little bit, you know, Wizard of Oz, a little bit behind the curtain. Nice. Well, as my entire purpose here is to to give you some exposure to to any place that I can, I want to ask you if you're willing to to give us a little bit of a performance here, and you know, just a snippet or a, a medley, whatever whatever strikes your fancy. Okay. You let's uh, <laughs> now. Obviously, I will point out to everyone out there that I usually have uh, like a backing track and beats and what have you, but uh, obviously we're just sitting here slightly acoustically. I might just it's, sit it's back an and angle this so we can see the for two people. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. There we go. There we go. <laughs> let's just see that. Yeah. Here we go. Right. Let's let's oh, see. Let's before you do, can you zoom oh, in yes. on that neck? Yeah. That is beautiful. Oh yes. There we go. This is uh I was saying earlier, someone at a show I said played a show in Manchester years ago <laughs> and this chap came up to me and just said, If you could have any ukulele in the world, what would it look like? And I said it would look like an old nineteen fifties Gretsch electromatic guitar. And then a couple of months later he gave me this and obviously it's got Chap hopping Mother of Pearl down the neck or <laughs> something that looks like Mother of Pearl anyway. Whether it's actually Mother of Pearl or not, I'm not exactly sure. So, great. so um, <laughs> we'll see. But uh, OK, so usually this I usually do this with a track. So it's amazing how much you tune into things which are on a on a track. But, you know, I'll see if I can do a little acoustic version. Um, this, be, yeah, this will involve singing along. So when people watch it, please feel free to sing the hail the chap bit that happens. But uh, yes. All hail the chap. Now we all know rules are there to be broken, but never have truer words been spoken. And in the code hereafter, hey presto, hear the ten rules of the chap manifesto. Thou shalt almost always wear tweed, it's the only fabric you shall ever need. Thou shalt never not smoke, pipes made from briar, booze aged in oak. Always be courteous to the ladies, give an air of Zeus with a dash of Hades. Never ever wear pantaloon denim, come on young scamps, there's still time to switch teams. Thou shalt always uh, doff one's hat if you're a flaneur, or simply like a stop and chat. Never fasten the lower button of one's waistcoat. We don't make the rules, it's just the biscuit. Thou shalt always speak properly. 
Don't give the Westwoods a monopoly. Never wear plimsolls if not doing sport, unless you're the chap hop superstar sort. Give the pipe a tap, park your rattle trap, raise your hat or cap, as we say, or hail the chap. All hail the chap. Awesome. <laughs> Much Gently abridged. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure. <laughs> All right. Um, before we get into the final segment, I, I want to set the rumor straight. Is it is it oh. true that the uh, the Kingsman movies were based loosely on your life? <laughs> I could neither confirm nor deny. I, okay. <laughs> NDAs have been signed somewhere along the way, and no one's allowed to say. So <laughs> um, we'll leave that hanging. Right. As we put a wrapper on this episode, I like to ask everybody. You know, one of the main <clears throat> reasons that I I did this whole series was that I'm I'm getting a chance to talk with people that have inspired me. So I want to hear a little bit about who inspired you. So any shout outs that you want to give to people, um, whether they're artists, authors, family, whoever that um, have inspired you along the way or inspire you to this day, it's just a chance for you to, to give them a shout. Oh, some shouts out. I mean, as far as musical influences go, we'd probably say people like, well, as I say, George Formby and, uh, Ronald Frankow is another sort of music hall act. It was very amusing, who I'd recommend checking out. Um, and then, of course, people like Chuck D and, uh, you know, Cool Herc and Grandmaster Flash and the progenitors, if you will, of, of hip hop. That's always the sort of the birth of hip hop is always the thing that's fascinated me almost most out of the whole thing. Just how this whole, you know, the, the dominant culture of the late 20th century just grew out of sort of poverty and Mm -hmm. you know the white white flight of the south bronx and everything like that so uh yeah they i mean and call Herc just never put a record out never really made much money out of it but he invented the whole thing but then more you know closer to home there's well my wife lady c has uh <laughs> always uh yeah she's always been just backed me up and just and she's designed most of my album covers and things like that she's a designer oh, that's great i, I love so, your album yeah. covers oh thank you Oh, she'd be very pleased to hear that. Um, yeah, and just she's been just been there the whole time, and just you know, work, pulling the strings as it were. And yeah, obviously, give a shout out to the family. It was actually my, you know, bless my my father passed away a few months ago, and um, it was. Uh, I remember me doing a show in in London a few years ago, or, you know, probably about four years ago, or so just before lockdown. And we were, my dad came along. We were just strolling along the street afterwards. And he just turned around to me and he said, do you know what? I'm glad you never got a proper job. Because usually it was like, he was all the time, was, you know, throughout my life was going, so when are you going to get a proper job though? When are you going to get a proper job? And so it was a lot of, th and it was a real revelation you know, moment. It was just like, oh my God, he actually kind of got it now. And he's realized that, <laughs> yeah, it's worth doing. So yes, that was good. But uh, yeah, so I guess those are people, I'm sure there's lots and lots of people I've missed out and, people I should be putting in there. It, it, it's, I've not talked to a single person that remembered everyone they wished they would have during the, the conversation. Exactly. So it's, it's to be expected, but um, yeah. you, you know, you've given out some of the, the important ones and you know, I, I appreciate it. So with that, I'm going to say, I cannot thank you enough. It was a pleasure yes. talking with you and uh, absolutely you a little bit more. <laughs> absolutely. Likewise. Thank you very much. Cheers. All right. Thank you. <laughs>